Ellie Childs, University of Birmingham and Christian Aid. I have a question about sustainability. Um, out of the 70 reports that you looked at and the 254, what proportion of them um, looked at outcome and impact level change from beyond end of project stage? What proportion kind of looked back three years later at the sustainability of the changes? Mm -hmm. Okay, a question here at the front. Um, Eric Levine from Girl Hub. Um, I guess it's, uh, I was similarly surprised by the basic stuff that you found missing in all this, and I'm curious if you had, um, mm -hmm. as part of this review, looked at the why, like where in the process? Is it is it because of a failure of, of donors uh, and what they're asking for and supporting, or the implementing agencies and what they're asking for, or the research agencies and what they're proposing to potential clients? Like where in the process of commissioning and delivering evaluations do we fall down on these basic things that should be included? Okay, I'm going to add a couple of online questions. Um, one question from Sally Baden. Um, she wants to ask why uh, you think there are all these gaps and what DFID is hoping to do about them, especially in respect of smaller organizations whom they fund. And a question from Deepta Chopra at IDS. Did you see any of the evaluations taking into account not just economic aspects, but social reproduction and unpaid care work issues? So I think we'll go with those um, for, actually, since I've got so many here, let me add one more <laughs> from Karen Moore. Um, is the preponderance of reports on financial services in both the long and short list due to the relatively high proportion of these projects? And she's an economic security advisor at Plan UK. Is the preponderance of reports on financial services, which was in that the highest category, um, in both the long and the short list due to a relatively high proportion of these projects or some other factor? Okay, so um, obviously everyone on the panel doesn't have to answer every question. Um, but maybe we should start um, with Georgia and then Paula. Um, okay, yes, the impact after three years. Um, I, don't, I don't think we have any figures on this, Paula, but you can correct me. Um, but we, we saw very few um, that actually did go back. And, and when we did see it, there was usually some really useful information there so I think that was um, that w that you could say is another gap is the evaluations going back after three or four years and and uh, redoing the work Paula did you have it do we have any figures well uh, the problem was we didn't um, the uh, statistics we could get for the 254 were based on the uh, on some variables that we coded for so we didn't code for okay. that so we can't yeah. have an exact figure but uh, we, we did discuss this because this was something that we, we were trying to look at and it was definitely few, uh, I guess I would say 10%, just um, yeah. as an approximate figure. But uh, we certainly thought that it would have been interesting to have more that uh, had this reflective perspective. Um, is it a failure of donors or research agencies? <laughs> that, the, that was the question. Um, I think it's both the evaluators the, who the evaluators commission, because quite honestly, you know, quite sometimes evaluators commission others to do the actual um, research and then they rely on, um, you know, focus group reports or that kind of thing. So there's all sorts of levels. And then how stringent are you as, um, you know, as a commissioning agency? I think it's all three levels. Um, and, you know, we didn't, we didn't tend to see, I mean, there were sometimes terms of reference in there but they were quite thin, to be quite honest, the ones that I looked at. And um, and I just know from my own experience over the last 15 years that I think that commissioning agencies are becoming more stringent now. I think there was a period where things were not as um, stringent and, and, and commissioning agents were quite happy to just get the evaluation done right. Fantastic, finish that off. And that was it. So I think now people are looking much more carefully at whether there's been an impact and what the impact's been and whether they can justify going on with programs or not. I don't think, I wonder whether, Zoe, you've got a comment on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I suppose in part that's why we commissioned this piece of work as well as, as its other reasons is a sense that we want to contribute to um, 
building capacity in the evaluation sector. There's a sense that it is in a way quite young, perhaps particularly in the UK, um, that we're just getting to grips with what it means to have a quality evaluation, what that looks like, um, with very different methods and often very different budgets, but still how can you do something that's a good quality at all ends of the spectrum. Um, so I think, yeah, we had a sense that things might be a bit shoddy, um, <laughs> but that was a bit more kind of anecdotal. So this is quite helpful in saying, yeah, okay, there is an awful lot that are just not doing the basic things, which are not necessarily that kind of technical, but like do say what the questions are. Um, so kind of good to, it's good to reinforce those messages. Um, and I certainly think, you know, you know, we're not in a great place in terms of our ability to commission, you know, in a way I've, g I've given you a an indication of that, that's something we're trying to get better at and have various quality assurance processes to improve that so that, you know, as a starting point, the terms of reference aren't like a dog's dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, right right from the beginning of the process, trying to um, just have a bit more kind of scrutiny and, and quality. Um, but yes, I agree, it was some of them you did think, God, I didn't think it was gonna be quite this bad. And, you know, we will have to, do a presentation to our head of research who will kind of probably tut and cluck and <laughs> evaluation puff, you know. <laughs> so we'll have to kind of, you know, in a way give heart that there is some quality out there and there are some moves to kind of, you know, adhere to more of the DAC standards and, uh, and others. Can, can I add something just quickly? Um, I think although the focus, uh, and, and I think Georgia noted when she was presenting that it sounded quite negative, <laughs> the report does highlight mm -hmm very good practices of, of good evaluations and not only uh, I mean, in some cases some examples of specific areas in which they did something good like the development of very useful indicators to measure uh, multi -dim multiple dimensions of women's economic empowerment or other evaluations that did, um, did a good job the whole way through so um, I th hopefully that the report will also be a good uh, uh, source of information of how to take the whole process through in, in a positive way. Okay, and um, do you want to make any comments, John? Could I make just two two really quick ones? The um, this this point about sustainability, uh, I think I think it's a really important one. And one of the thoughts going on in the back of my mind while I was reading the report was, why why is there no mention of monitoring? It's all about evaluation. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm I'm not an M and E kind of want myself but I, I know lots of people that I, I've got a great deal of respect for that are and they say it's all about monitoring if you want to if you want to improve the quality of development projects how about looking at how they perform as they go along and so that you can actually start doing some of that action learning all the stuff we've been talking about and not doing for the last 50 years and so you can improve things as you're going along rather than just a, an evaluation at the end and concluding you know that you seven out of ten or whatever and the the other comment from the girl uh, um, uh, Eric from the girl hub I thought the uh, I thought it's a really good question actually and I think it's a probably if you look too closely just to to remind others it was why why is the basic stuff being got wrong and I think probably if you look closely at it um, it's quite a lot to do with the political economy of aid and it it takes you to places that aren't that savory but there, there can be uh, very strong incentives for, for donors, for consultants, um, uh, and for, for government organisations in recipient countries to not be entirely truthful about the impact of aid. What I think is, is terrific, though, is that that culture is beginning to be broken, and at people actually there's beginning to be a, a political head of interest in... in correct evaluations and um, one, one of the things I, I found really interesting is that development was kind of behind most of the public sector for, for a long time and so one of the quick ways I think we can improve evaluation and I, I've seen it with colleagues myself is, is go and find evaluators from the European Union, from the London Development Agency, people who have actually been implementing serious evaluations for, for a number of years. And that, that's where I think a lot of the improvements, the rapid improvements in evaluation have come from. It's, it's where, because it hasn't involved developing countries and it's involved London, for instance, it's important. And you just wouldn't get away with some of the, the stuff that you see in, in developing country uh, uh, <laughs> development initiative 
evaluations and it's a way of very quickly getting a bit more serious about it. Uh, can I just say something about the yes. financial yes. services because yes. we missed miss that one and also unpaid care. Um, we weren't specifically <coughs> looking at um, unpaid care and reproductive um, work but obviously you know that that did come in to some of the evaluations and there were measurements of um, the time and also looking at time saving devices and methods that did come in but there wasn't there wasn't masses on that and in terms of financial services I mean I I remember a time when all anything you did in terms of private sector development was all about financial services and I think that's why we've got so many evaluations is because you ask any business what their main problem is they'll say oh, I haven't got enough money and usually it's not just about that it's about the fact that they don't know how to count their money or it could be about the fact they don't know how to market their products or they don't even know what the market is so there's all sorts of issues there but people always say I haven't got enough money and they're always given financial services so there is an issue around this element and also if you look at microfinance I mean we do this in development this is what we everyone says go and do microfinance but if you look at the actual penetration of microfinance services it's absolutely tiny in comparison to mainstream financial services and what the impact it would have on the whole economy so it's something to think about there <laughs> okay great J uh, can I just add something quickly there? very quickly uh, Pala, so we can take a few more Oh, sorry, just to add uh, on the point of uh, reproductive health services and, and care work, there were a, a couple of the really good evaluations I can remember off the top of my head, one um, in Uganda with BRAC, uh, that one focused on adolescent girls that did incorporate that. So when we look about um, at dimensions of skill development, we include in that category skill development and life skills around uh, reproductive health, for example, and that, that's uh, an important dimension we take into account. Okay, I'm going to take just a couple more questions because I've also got quite a lot online. Um, <laughs> so there, there's one at the front here that I saw first and one over here since I've neglected this corner of the room. Um, if we could have your two questions and then I've got some online and then we'll have to end the session. So microphone over here. Hi, my name is Michelle, I'm a PhD student. Um, a couple of things we've touched on, but I have one question because we run out of time. Um, when you're mentioning access to markets, what does that exactly mean, access to markets? Because you have tried to deconstruct a very complex situation over the world, which it means different things in different countries. And with your mention about reproductive, <coughs> unpaid reproductive work, how can you do a gender analysis without incorporating that? Because that is the fundamental core in any gender analysis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One question here. David Wolcombe, Peace Child International, currently engaged on uh, three gender projects in West Africa, um, on which we're being asked to focus on cost, effe cost effectiveness questions. And that hasn't come up in our discussions today. And I wonder if... Uh, you, Zoe, feel that it's still a priority. Also, the um, question of uh, involvement of men and boys. Far and away, the biggest uh, number of questions that I got in response to my programs in West Africa is why, are this is, why is this only a girl child's project? Why is it not including um, men and boys? And I think on the ground, a lot of people have run into this problem that if you do just focus on gender issues, African cultures tend to resent you very strongly. And I wonder what your feelings about that is. Okay, I'm going to add just a couple of online questions. Um, if I haven't asked your question online, apologies, we've got a lot of them. Um, so one, um, uh, okay, uh, uh, from Hannah Cook from the University of Edinburgh, could Georgia or Paolo say a bit more about why the studies looked at had been commissioned, were they intended for donors as well? Um, and a quick response myself to a couple of them. All the products will be um, available online, including the annexes. And there's a question also from Sally Baden again saying, will there be uh, any more best practices, concise communications products coming out of this report? Um, and I think that's something um, that we'd obviously like to consider. Um, so the last one is, um, were there any consideration of post-conflict affected environments and how peace took hold or didn't due to economic empowerment? Uh, 
Um, let's start, um, uh, I think probably Paula and, Paula, would you like to go first? Sure, sorry, I was in mute. Um, I think to answer some of the, the questions, uh, the first one, I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't really hear it, so I'll leave it to Georgia. The problem, I guess, with the audio. The, in case of post-conflict uh, affected environments, we didn't uh, look for that specifically, so only when it came up uh, as part of the search, we, as we said we were focusing geographically at uh, lower and middle income countries um, without us. So um, I can't remember off the top of my head uh, any examples of, uh, of an intervention conflict affected country uh, context, it, it, but um, we, we can look in the database. It, it might just be that they're not uh, sufficiently analyzed from the perspective of women and girls economic empowerment. It could be a gap that we hadn't identified. So that's an interesting one. In terms of um, how we're documenting best practices, so as I mentioned in the report in itself, it, there are some sort of um, text boxes and uh, figures and references to good practices, whereas, um, so we mentioned we're developing some fact sheets that we're uh, shortly about to finish that are of the 15 best uh, uh, scored of those 70 reports uh, and that contains sort of a, a brief analysis of, of what the, you know, the, the, the best um, elements of the methodology and also of some elements of the findings and outcomes. So those will also be made available online as soon as they're finalized and um so we have that i didn't get the other questions so I'll, I'll hand them over to georgia okay so i'm going to ask the the panel here to just spend one minute if you can just summing up with an answer to a question okay. should you uh, yeah reproductive work how can you do gender analysis without it yes totally agree I haven't really got much more to say on that. I think it's essential. Um, defining access to markets, I think we need a whole other meeting on that. But it's, you know, it, it could be any range of different ways. It could be physical access to markets. It could be information. It could be to do with knowledge around how you understand markets. It, you know, there are, there are a whole range of different access to market issues that I think you need to look at. Um, and uh, and also not just local but regional and international uh, what have you um, there was a question about cost effectiveness that was directed at Zoe but we did you know we did pick up and I think that there still is in the report a small section on where cost effectiveness was evaluated that w it, it wasn't done very much and I suspect that if we look do this again in five years time we'll find an awful lot more on that so um, it's certainly an area that's been growing as as a, an essential part of an evaluation, um, you know, product is that you, you generally now would have something on cost effectiveness, but it does depend on who the commissioning agency is. Um, and uh, yes, this issue of why you're not including men and boys, I don't see how you can't mm -hmm. include men and boys, not not just in terms of whether they are receiving the intervention, you know, part of the intervention itself, but also um, norms and behavior around gender are all about men and boys and women and girls interacting together. So um, there has to be inclusion of men and boys. Um, Zoe, did you want to say something about cost effectiveness? Sure, I mean, yes, just briefly. Yeah, in DFID, certainly, value for money, cost effectiveness. I still hear a lot about them. <laughs> they're, they're definitely still priorities. I think we're still struggling to work out how you sensibly go about certainly assessing the value for money, but people are doing their very best to work out the value of a thing and the cost of a thing and try and find sensible ways of putting that together. Um, I, I feel like one of the main, you know, someone asked what, what will DFID do. In a way, I don't know what DFID will do, but I'm getting nearer to knowing what Claire and I might try and do <laughs> in terms of, you know, which things we'll push internally. And I think this issue of men and boys just seems so long overdue. We've kind of known this for a long time, whether we're working on violence issues, economic empowerment. And we think, oh, because we're trying to help women and girls, we'll go and work with women and girls. It's, it's crazy. And I know there are, there are programs that have kind of, you know, taken that to heart. Um, and are acting on it, but it just doesn't feel like enough, or certainly enough of different programs <laughs> have kind of heard that message. So I would take that as a big one to, for us to um, follow up on. And yes, I think in terms of comms products, I think the fact sheets will be very helpful. And I think we also need to think about a kind of two-page pithy um, summary, because 
you know, most of my colleagues will not have time to read something this long. So we need to make sure that the kind of really, you know, a bit provocative, interesting things that will kind of stay with them and what we really want them to do differently are, are highlighted on one or two pages so they can't miss it. Yeah, I know we're really short of time, so two really quick comments. Um, on the uh, cost effectiveness, uh, I think that, for me, I, I think it, what's important is, is it just economy, meaning least cost, or is it actual effectiveness, like delivering a, a development impact? If it's the former, it's, it's a very partial thing. If it includes the latter, I think it's, it's absolutely fair enough and should, should be part of any standard evaluation. And then in terms of the uh, involvement of uh, men and boys, I, I was taken back to um, in the uh, late 1990s, sounds a long time ago now, in South Africa, in there was a social survey done in south of Johannesburg amongst young men, 20% uh, of whom uh, said that gang rape was one of their sporting activities. And I think that if you, if anyone's worked in areas with very high levels of sexual violence, it is insane not to work with the people that perpetuate that violence, if if you're trying to trying to have it reduced. So, uh, I'd say an absolute yes on on that as well. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to thank the, all the panel and presenters for um for, for a very very good session. Um, I think we've learnt a lot. Um, all of the materials will be online, they should be there within 48 hours, including um, a recording of this event. Um, and so um, it just leaves me to ask you to thank everyone um, in the normal way. Thank you. Thank you.